Um, yeah, just a very brief question. Um, very interesting. I really am uh, in love with all what you're teaching. And what I wanted to know is, for my further reading, do you have any recommendations, so further, suggestions, further reading on what you've been talking about? Yeah. So the question is, what further reading do you recommend? And my answer is, I will have a good think about this. I will make up a little list, and I will send it to Andy, who will send it to anybody who's interested. OK? So, and yes, there is. Yes, there are good ones. But I, I want to think about it properly and send it to you with all the links and everything. So. I'll put it on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, put it on Instagram. All right. So I, I liked what you were talking about the principalities and how businesses can kind of wage war yeah. in spiritual warfare. And evidence of that would be like Salvation Army or hospitals yeah. or things. How do you how do you keep those institutions that you you've created to battle yeah. from becoming principalities on such their own? Good, such a good question. Um, Okay, the first thing I would say is they always are a principality. They always will be. And our task is not, our task as Christians is to create principalities that stay angelic and not to have principalities that become demonic. And to always notice that principalities kind of want to become demonic. That's part of the fall. That principality, the things we create always want to become the thing in which we live and move and have our being. So think about how our, our nations tell you like, your highest identity is if you kill and die for your nation. Or our businesses say, you need to give the best of years of your life to this business. You know, they are institu Or families say, family's all important. Our family is all the most important thing. To hell with everyone else, right? You're being told this human institution that we've agreed on is the, where you live and move and have your being. Well, guess what? That is an idol. Because God the Father is in whom we live and move and have our being. So our task is, is to create, we cannot help but have institutions, we always will, and our task as Christians is how do we stop them? Can we recognize when they've started to act like little gods, right? That's our task. And that's what was happening in the New Testament. So he's, he's like, don't create... Jesus says, don't try and uh, wear long robes and have fancy titles and have people, um, you know, revere you. And don't take the place of high position and don't be like the Gentiles and lord it over. And Paul's like, do consider others better than yourself and submit one to another. And, you know, and look at the cross. This is what happened at the cross where the king of the kingship of the universe is shown in the self-emptying of becoming like a servant. And, and, and becoming like a servant, not becoming servile, but saying, I exist for the will of other people. That's what a servant does. They exist for the will. So how do we do that as Christians? How do we make institutions? Um, I, Claire always gets me in trouble whenever I say this, because it's like, it's a big word, I understand. I know it's a big word that doesn't, that means a lot of things. The best... Um, the best political phrase for how Christians organize themselves is anarchy. Um, and then I very quickly say it's Christian anarchy. And I don't mean by anarchy throwing a brick through a bank window or killing a police officer and running away. I don't mean that. I do mean politically, if you look at like how po different the political spectrum, the anarchists are the ones who seek to give power away and who hold their institutions lightly. So anarchy doesn't mean lawlessness. What it does mean on a kind of a political spectrum is we hold our institutions lightly, and if they no longer serve the purpose, we dismantle them. And we're, we're free to do it. Uh, can I give you a really good example? You know um, Mike Pilavachi, yeah. Yeah. right? And the Soul Survivor Movement. Who's been a part of that? Do you know about like, what they've just recently done? So I'll say to the people in the room who maybe don't know, Mike Pilavachi started this massive youth, spirit-filled youth movement. I mean, changed church history kind of thing. And he's, when he started it, he said, we will stop if the Lord asks us to stop. And just last year, the Lord asked them to stop. And, he, and Mike, uh, you know, he, he said, it isn't, it's not because of moral failing, and it's not because we've run out of money, and it's not because we're not popular anymore. The Lord asked us to stop, and so we're going to stop. And that's 
Christian anarchy. He's not saying, we've built this institution, and by God, it's just going to keep rolling forward into history no matter what. He said, we've built this institution, and we are willing to stop it if it no longer is supposed to be what God wants for us, right? And that's what I mean. So I feel like he's a re- that's a really good example of, like, they've stopped Soul Survivor from becoming a little god. And something new is going to happen. They with, he withdrew his will, and more wills are going to take place. There's other festivals that are going to pop up or something. Right? So, you know, all Christian institutions are like that. So as if you find yourself in positions of public leadership with your institutions, the question you always need to ask yourself is, like, are we... Who is... Who is in, uh, have we grown inhuman? Or are the people that we are serving, are they just numbers to us now? Or are they just, do we have to say computer says no to anyone? And if you do, then as a Christian, you're like, okay, something, we've grown inhuman. How do we reform ourselves? How do we, what's getting in the way of us seeing the human in front of us? And one example, one obvious answer is groups can get too big. And it is totally possible for churches to get too big which is why I like the church planting movement, where churches say, oh, if, we're, if we don't, if this room has too many people in it, then we'll just plant a new church, you know? And that's a good example of just holding your institutions lightly. But so, yeah, it always changes, but it always kind of comes down to, like, do we, have we lost our purpose? Are, are, are the people that, are the people being forced to serve us rather than us serve the people? Are people becoming inhuman or dehumanized in our institutions? And if that's true, then, then as Christians, we're like, oh, okay, so now we've, we've, we're, we're becoming demonic, not angelic. That's all I would say. Yeah. Okay, so now we got... I think we probably have room for about two or three more. Uh, man, woman, man, woman. I think it's Luke. Man, woman, man, woman, Andy. Love it. Hi. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanted to perhaps maybe just elaborate a bit on the whole issue of uh, powers and principalities and to just say sort of from my perspective, and thank you very much in terms of expanding the thinking to mm-hmm. look at it not just from the sinister perspective of always looking at it from a demonic perspective, mm-hmm. but also just the institutions that we we institutionalize things and it goes against the grain in terms of what Christ perhaps wants to do in mm-hmm. our sort of environment. But to reinforce as an African, um, if you kind of consider the, the, the fact that um, before the advent of Christianity, and this is going sort of a long way back, before the advent of Christianity, we always worshipped things. Obviously, mm-hmm. we didn't worship Christ. Um, but as Africans, most families sort of worshipped deities and worshipped yeah. gods. Yeah. And so... I have a sort of a a much more sinister sort of conception when we talk about powers and principalities because that's my experience, both from sort of the family lineage that I come from as well as what I understand that in the context of being a Nigerian, being an African. And I want us to sort of understand that as a collective of people from different backgrounds and races, for some of us, when we talk about powers and principles, I'm not t- just talking about government things. No, no, no. You know what I mean? I'm actually talking about the understanding of sort of the vi- very real, potent powers and forces that are malevolent. Because, spirit. Yes, malevolent yeah. spirit. So, so, you absolutely right. I am not disagreeing with you at all. And you yourself said family spirits, family gods. And that, that is my point is that we as humans have created the environment in which those things are allowed to take root and have power and we use and and that and then it's so interesting so wherever christianity takes root whether jesus christ takes root i don't care about the christian religion but where jesus christ shows up one of the first challenges is to the family gods and to that kind of and i use the word tribal spirit not in a kind of like african tribal way but like humans like to group together and say that I want to be with people who look like me and sound like me as much as possible, <laughs> right? And that's tribalism. And then we spiritualize it and we create spirit and we welcome spirits into that home and we use our tribalism to wage war on other tribes, right? And other people who don't look like us and sound like us and we curse them and we and like the whole it, the whole story here is like these real spirit these are and I'm not saying they aren't real, but I'm saying what is their reality? 
What is their reality? Their reality is they've been given a home, a welcome home. And we have to say, you are not welcome in this home. That's what I'm saying. So I'm not saying the spirits don't exist. I'm saying, pay attention. Spirits have to go somewhere. And then Jesus talks about this, and then he cast the, the, the spirits out of the man, and the spirit said, well, we need to go somewhere. And he says, go to the herd of pigs. In the New Testament, spirits always have to be attached. And so our job as Christians is to say, you aren't, you're not attached to us. You're not welcome. We're not making an environment that is, right? Do you hear what I'm saying? So I'm not saying you're ignorant if you believe in spirits and you should believe in government instead. I'm not saying that. I'm saying government itself is a, is a spiritual home, and we've helped to create a place for bad spirits, malevolent spirits who are the enemy of the cross of Christ. That's what I'm saying. So it's, and I'm just saying, add to this. Add to our, when we wage spiritual warfare, like add to what you've got. Don't take away. Add to it that we also are doing it when, we, when we're honest you know, with our neighbors about whether we paid. I, we're, we show honesty about paying taxes or we keep to the speed limit or we refuse to, we, we give. I have a friend who's, do you know who Bob Ekblad is? Bob and Gracie Ekblad, they, they run a, um, they're lovely, spirit-filled, radical Christians. Um, he comes over, they come over to the England a lot, but they're American. And they, like, run a little kind of commune. They're total spirit-filled. He wrote, there's, there's a documentary going out called Liberating Fire about his life that some of you should check out. You know, they, they basically provide a home for illegal immigrants and asylum seekers. And they're like, these are human beings. We're going to provide a home. The whole world, everybody in America is like saying how awful these people are and how it's destroying the nation. And they're like, that's a principality. It's telling us to dehumanize humans. We're going to welcome them. You know? And, and it's a total spirit-filled anarchy. He's breaking the law because he's saying, you are a human being and we're going to give you dignity. You know? So sometimes waging your powers and principality warfare means keeping the law, and sometimes it means breaking the law, but it's always like, where is a human being being dehumanized? Yeah? So, but that's spiritual warfare, and it's, but it's done through the language of government and stuff. Yeah, let's have another mic. As I understood you yesterday, with an example of the five, you said Jesus changed everything. He, he was like, an anarchist, in a way. The example of the five. You remember the five people, the Ike and the other four ladies? Oh, yeah. They went across. Yeah. But then, in Matthew five seventeen, Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law, I came to yeah. fulfill it. Yeah. So, to me, what you said and what I've just read appear to be a contradiction. Yeah. And I like your explanation. Okay, so, Jesus is always saying things like, okay, good question. So, he's always, this is one of those examples of... Jesus is forever saying, <laughs> this is part of his, this is what made people so frustrated by it. it. It really, pardon my French, it really pissed people off to the point where they wanted to kill him. Because he would constantly say, oh, you, you like the law? I love the law too. It's just that it doesn't look like what you think it looks like. And he was, you know, I told this before, I love chosen person language. It's just that it looks different. I love... Passover language, it just it looks different. I love the temple, it just it looks different. And he did that with the law. So he says, I haven't come to destroy the law, I've come to fulfill it. And then like two seconds later he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you. Or he tells the story about the, uh, the, the Good Samaritan, which is, you know, do you know that in Leviticus, a neighbor is defined, go and look it up, the, the, the language of love your neighbor as yourself in Leviticus is defined. Your neighbor is your fellow Israelite. And then you go and you read the story of the Good Samaritan, and the neighbor is defined as the Samaritan, the foreigner. Okay? Jesus is making, he's, he's like, I love good neighbor language. It's just, it doesn't look like what you think it looks like. And the, the law is one of those stories. And, and people are always coming to Jesus in the New Testament about the law. Um, and they're going, well, Moses told us to do this, and Moses said that, right? There's loads of these examples. And Jesus basically says, Moses? Let me tell you about Moses. I was there, <laughs> right? Or Abraham? Let me tell you about Abraham. I was there, and he laughed when he saw me. You know, 
The New Testament spends a lot of energy telling you that Jesus was present at the beginning of it all, and he's the one who's the lens through whom. So he's, he's not anti, he's like, yeah, I was there, Moses received the law, and this is what it means to follow it now. And, and that, I'm not pretending that it doesn't cause uh, upset and rupture. It did. That's what it did do. I mean, it, it actually caused conflict. Because he said, yeah, we're, gonna, we're on a collision course now with there's different ways of people thinking they're keeping the law. And my way is the right way, because I was there at the beginning of the That's the big bitter pill that you have to swallow if you're a Christ follower. Um, and it leads to all sorts of questions, of course. It doesn't answer all of our complicated questions, but it, it at least raises this, the kind of question. So put it this way, I'd rather have the question, how do I, as a Christ follower, how do I deal with the genocide passages in Joshua, okay? That's a Christian problem. What do I do with these Old Testament texts, right? A non-Christian problem is the Old Testament said to dash your baby's head, the enemy's baby's head on the rocks. I guess we've got to do that. How do we do that? Just ignoring that Jesus actually had something to say about whether you should kill your foreign enemies or not. So it's kind of like, I'm not saying that it solves all our problems. It's just saying it raises Christian problems rather than non-Christian problems. Does this make sense? So, yeah, so the law is something that Jesus, you cannot understand Jesus without talking about the law and talking about the, the whole context that he came into and the Hebrew scriptures define him and give him a personality and a purpose. And they're all, his, it's his comment on them. But again, I said this before, you need to affirm what he affirmed and don't affirm what he didn't affirm and, and pay attention to the fact. If you ever find yourself saying, I know Jesus said this, but it says in Exodus, you know, you need to stop. Because he, he's doing it wrong, right? Yeah. And that's not the same as saying Exodus is useless. All scripture is useful and God-breathed. But sometimes it's useful as an example of, of the difference. Like a really good example is, so you know the story of, um, in, we have in the Old Testament, we have the story of Elijah was walking through a village and some boys came out and they, uh, or he was in a village and they rejected him, so he called down fire on the village, right? So fast forward now, a few thousand years later, a thousand years later, and you've got Jesus is with James and John, who are the sons of thunder. And another way of translating sons of thunder is sons of anger, his disciples. And they're going through a Samaritan village. And the Samaritans, who are the foreigners, reject Jesus. And what do James and John want to do? They say, can we call down fire like in the days of Elijah? And what does Jesus do? No. He, he didn't affirm that prophet right? That is a useful scripture for correcting because it says that's not Jesus's way. Again, I'm not pretending it's not a compli- it does It raises complications, but that's what we have is we have a Jesus who said that. He talks about the sign of Jonah, the prophet Jonah. You know, what is the sign of Jonah, right? I mean, it's, it's he's thrown into the sea and then up again in, in three days, the belly of the whale, but it's also, what did Jonah do? Yeah, why was he disobedient? So, jo- so Jonah's told by God, go to, you, go to the enemies and preach um, repentance to them. And Jonah disobeys. Why? Because he's scared. And also why? He says that because they, deser- they don't deserve it. Finally, he goes. He preaches repentance. They do repent. Then what happens? He gets in a sulk. And he says, oh, I knew this because you're a good God and you show mercy on your enemies. And God says, why shouldn't I show mercy? They're people who don't know any better, and they have lots of cows. And then the, the story ends, and it's only two pages long. Jesus quotes, he talks about the sign of Jonah more than he talks about other prophets. And when he talks about the sign of Jonah, he's talking about that. I'm here to preach God's goodness to your enemies. You know? So, affirm what he affirmed. Yeah. Let us do our thing. I have a question. Okay. Thank then, you very much, Stephen. It was great. And many of the principles that you brought were tremendous. Um, especially the, the last one about the mutual, the mutual um, submission. But my question is, um, do you think that exerting authority can 
be a problem then is, is something that uh, put me in a risk place or is something that uh, should call the demons to come and oppress us or something like that? Do you understand the question? I don't really understand. Did <clears throat> yeah, because mutual submission is yeah. amazing, is what I believe. Yeah, for <laughs> but, us as Christians. Yes, yeah. but uh, we have authorities yeah. that need to uh, exert this authority. That is, is, is right, is correct. Uh, for example, give me give you an example. Yesterday, your wife was uh, preaching. I adore her, actually. <laughs> uh, uh, and and was I really admire her because she was very brave, challenged us to um, to speak in tongues. Um, but it was interesting that the authorities said, "Okay, yes, but just close your eyes." Okay. Uh, you know, the, he intervened. Uh, yep. the, the pastor intervened. Uh, to make the same, but a, a bit complete. Yeah. To complete that. Yeah. Uh, that is okay, that is fine, yeah. or how do you see that? Oh, that's a good example. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 it's a really good example. Because that was a really good example of, of, of actual uh, mutual submission. So Andy withdraws his ego to allow me to come. I'm listening to Claire, and I withdraw my ego to allow her to speak. Claire, who has never led a group of people in praying in tongues before, because she's being led, but she's listening to the Holy Spirit, and he's saying, I want to do this, and she's like, okay, let's do it. She then withdraws her ego to allow Andy to speak, to say, oh, do you know, this is how a good way to organize this room is, and Claire, like, receives that. Nobody's being humiliated here. But Claire isn't saying, this is my microphone, <laughs> right? I know the way to do it. She's like, oh, okay, okay, so a good way to do it. And then by shutting our eyes, we're actually creating an environment in which other people, other wills are free to flourish because now people aren't being looked at. So we've just created an environment in which people are allowed to respond because we've all, like, withdrew our wills a little bit, right? So that's a really good example, I think, of, like a, of an angelic way of, of organizing ourselves. And, and Andy's holding the space. Like, he's responsible for the space, you know, for various reasons. He's, it's his space, and he's managing it by saying, this is how we do things in our space. And so I don't see that as a problem at all. And then there is a big difference between how we organize ourselves as Christ followers and then how we respond to the world around us that isn't organized according Christ follower ways. And, but it is interesting to point out, and I, I really don't have time to go into it, but you need to pay attention to like how often the Christians do respond to evil powers also by a form of submission to them. But submission is not the same as obedience. So an example is when Peter and um, James are in the, uh, they're preaching and it, this is in Acts, and they're, they're preaching in the name of Jesus, and the authorities pick them up and arrest them, right? Peter doesn't organize him. They don't run away, and he doesn't organize his followers to try and fight it. They submit to, the, to being arrested. They go before the authorities. The authorities say, stop preaching in Jesus' name. Peter and James go off. What do they do? They disobey instantly. And then they're arrested again. And they submit to the arrest, and they get put in jail. They recognize the authority of the land, and they disobey it at the same time. Then there's an earthquake, and the doors fly open. What happens? They stay there. Peter stays in prison, OK? There's something about, like the, and, and the Christians did this when they were faced persecution in front of Caesar, and they were thrown to the wild dogs. They, wouldn't, they didn't like fight. They submitted to it, and in the submission to that, they prayed. Did you know this? They publicly prayed for Caesar before they were killed. And it was in those public prayers and the way they faced death, in their submission to Caesar. But praying for Caesar's protection is also the form of disobedience, because you're not allowed to do that. You know, in their, in their disobedient submission, they revealed something Christ-like. We need to stop.